Um, the buyer's also going to want to see a survey just to make sure that he knows there was the boundary. And it could be a plat. And we go back to that chapter where we're talking about, you know, lot five of modular estates per plat book 41. That is usually the most common because the house or property is already laid out. He's going to want to see title evidence. He's going to want to make sure that the title insurance policy is in place. They're going to have those title searches that is going to be made. That is also something that the buyer is going to want. Now, what does the seller want? Well, really, it boils down to one major thing. <laughs> right. He wants the money. He wants to make sure that the money is there, that the lender that the buyer has borrowed the money from, the lender will wire the money into the closing company. Now, there's a very important factor you need to understand currently. At the closing, the money that the borrower borrows from a lender is actually considered a credit to the borrower. Now, I know most of you go, that's not true. It's a debit. I got to pay for it. It will be a debit when you sign the IOU. But the money the lender has placed in the title company is very much a, like your buddy handed you some money and said, here's some money, go, go buy your house. That's what's going on. So the lender is going to wire money into the title company in that loan amount that you agreed upon. And that is going to be seen as a credit to the buyer. At the closing table, I, I, the buyer, I'm going to bring in my down payment money and my buddy, whose name is Chase Bank, has given me $280,000. It is going to be a credit on the closing documents because it is a loan that I borrowed. So when we get to this a little later, please don't be confused because the loan is going to show up as a credit for the closing and then you sign it and the IOU and you make the mortgage and the, as the mortgagor, now it's a debit that you owe to your lender. But at the closing, it's a credit to the borrower. What is the role of the real estate professional? Well, it's a real easy role. Bring me my money. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, so what happened? What is your job as the real estate professional at the closing? Most states require that the uh, client be represented at the closing. So you have to be there. Now, I will tell you, if you've done your job correctly up until this point, you will actually be worthless or should be useless at the closing, right? Because you are only there in the capacity to help explain something that your client doesn't understand. You should have explained all this prior to that. So literally, a good agent is useless at closing. I know it sounds funny, because literally, you should have already explained. Now, that's Client could go, hey, man, what is this form? And you go, oh, well, that's the lead-based paint form. Remember, we talked about it. you got to fill that out. That's what you're there for, but you should have already done all of that. Typically, what happens, and let's see if we can do it on this camera, most agents sit way down here out of view of everybody, and you sit facing the other agent, and you're doing stuff like, hey, so how's your business going? Yeah, well, my kids are tired. I've got volleyball tonight with my children. And then you go, oh, wow, we're done? Okay, thank you. So that is your role, is to help answer questions. And they may look to you for guidance or assistance.
But theoretically, you should have done all of that. Now, the, the, the joke that I just made is actually kind of true because this is the time at which you will collect the check that it was our commission, all right? Now, that check is going to be made out to the brokerage name in which you represent. Now, if you're the managing broker, then potentially it could be you. But remember, you are representing me, the Modulin Group, or Keller Williams, or Fathom, in this closing. So they cannot pay you directly. You can only receive pay from your employing broker. So the check will be made out to the company name. And what happens is you go back to the office and you turn it into your office admin and go, hey, I had a closing. Here's the paperwork, which we're going to talk about. And the check. Now the broker takes that check and then based on whatever split you had agreed to, which we've discussed in the previous chapter, he will then write you a check out of his general account so that you now get paid. That time frame can vary and technology now allows for all kinds of things. For example, in our company, we don't write checks. Everything's now direct deposit. We take the money, put the money right in your bank account so that you have it. So it, it, the technology or the mechanics could be different, but theoretically, you bring the check into the office for the total commission, and then I write you a check for whatever split we agreed on, that 50-50 or 80-20 or whatever it is. So that is the process. Now, you will also be given some documents that we as the brokerage must keep under state law. Typically, it is a copy of whatever client you're serving. If we are the selling agent, meaning we're working with the buyer, we'll get a copy of those documents. If we're working with the seller, i.e. the listing agent, we get a copy of those documents. Those documents must be kept by the brokerage for a spe specified amount of time. Usually it's three years, could be five years. Some forms maybe is only one year. But those documents you would bring as well. Most brokerages use that as the hammer, meaning, hey, you didn't bring me all the documents, so I'm not going to cut you your check yet because you're missing a form. And your brokerage that you work for will have a procedure and they will educate you on, hey, we need these documents and we need a commission payout form or we need whatever form. And those, that's usually our hammer because you brought me the check and I'm going, well, I'm not paying you because you're missing a document and I don't want to go chase it. You better go chase it. And then when you bring that in, now your package is complete with all of the documents. Now I'll pay you. Okay. So that is your um, role at the closing is one is to provide services still because it's still our client. Now, like I said, when that title transfers, boop, agency technically ends. So when you walk into the closing, you are actually walking in with a client because we still have agency with them. Once the deal gets completed, boop, the title transfers, we have fulfilled our agency and technically under the eyes of the law, you would walk back out of that building with a customer now because agency's terminated. Now, we all still treat them like a client because when you get in the parking lot, you're like, hey, good job. Here's a couple of my business cards. If you've got friends or family and you want them to get the great service that I gave you, Pat, feel free to pass my card out and refer my name, all right? But technically, it's a customer at that point. The lender is actually going to have an interest in this. And typically, the lender's interest is the same as the buyer's interest. 
He may want a copy of the survey. He may want a copy of the title insurance policy. He may want a copy of your homeowner's insurance policy to make sure the house has insurance. He may get other reports like the uh, septic report or the well report or the termite report. They may get what's called the certificate of occupancy, which we haven't got to yet, but it's for a new bill. They may have all kinds of requirements that the buyer has. They may ask for proof of, re of receipts for that lien that got paid off but doesn't show yet. So their interest virtually is identical to the buyer's interest. If your loan came through a mortgage broker, he may show up as well because he gets paid that day too for brokering the loan between you and Chase Bank. So your mortgage broker may show up. Now, typically when they do, they don't show up and sit through the whole closing because their main interest is one, picking up the check, but two, smoozing with you when you're done as compared to the real estate agent who's going to be involved with questions the mortgage broker typically is not sitting in the closing he could if he's a good friend of yours he may do it just to show that hey i'm a good guy and i'm here in case you have loan questions so the mortgage broker may show up the irs has an interest in this because you may have made a profit on the sale of your property and they want to make sure that they know there was a profit so that they can expect you to pay taxes on it. Now, remember back in a previous chapter, if you are single and you profited less than $250,000 and you live there more than two out of five years, there are no taxes. If you're married, it's the first 500. So you, they will have to know that. Well, I bought it for 300, sold it for 400, and I'm single. There would be no taxes because you did not meet that cap of $250,000. The seller will have to have an IRS interest because he's going to want some tax deductions on down the line, like uh, interest on a loan real estate taxes. He's going to qualify for a homeowner's exemption. So the IRS has interest in this closing as well. So let's talk about the actual mechanics of conducting the closing. There are many names that is used and I have seen them vary state by state by state. Like I said earlier, we can call it the settlement. We can call it closing the escrow. You can call it passing papers. Uh, I call it payday. Whatever terminology you use in your area or state that you're sitting in, you will learn this one real quick. Now, there are typically two ways to do this closing. And I'm going to tell you that since 2020, a couple years ago, there have bastardized some of these to create these infinite number of ways now that they can close. But generally, they fall in two categories. The most common one I would have told you is what we call a face-to-face -face closing. All right. This is where both parties show up at the same time and one sits on one side of the table and the other sits on the other side of the table. And that is the most common. And that's why you will often hear this called a side. I've got the seller side. I've got the buyer side. If I have both, then you would say I've got both sides. There are a lot of companies that count how many sides you do a year so that you could go, well, I close 24 sides. Most agents say I close 24 acts. Uh, uh, closings. But if you did both, that might count as two. All right. In your company or in your MLS system that tracks these. And there are people that are really big on how many closings I had because they feel nice and proud to go people. Well, I closed 64 closings. Well, I closed 30, but they were all 
dual agency, so that's 60 sides. 